Hello class, Professor Mandeville back. This is lecture number 19 for History 101. And last time we left off with uh, Thomas Jefferson, excuse me, being reelected in uh, 1804. And remember, he dumped his vice president when he had the opportunity, Aaron Burr, and he selected Governor George Clinton uh, of the state of New York and the namesake of our county as his vice president. Now, uh, there was another election then that happened in 1804 uh, that is important for many different reasons. And that's uh, the wide open governor's election right here in the state of New York because... Uh, Governor Clinton had left office to run for vice president with Jefferson. So in this particular election, one of the major candidates running for the governorship of New York was former vice president Aaron Burr. Now, he was actually still vice president when running. Uh, Aaron Burr... Uh, was a, an interesting character, to say the least. And he had his enemies. Obviously, uh, politically speaking, he made an enemy out of President Jefferson. But he also had enemies on the other side of the political aisle back then, the Federalists. And one person who could not really stand him at all was the most famous New Yorker at the time, former Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Now, when Aaron Burr decides to run for the governorship of New York, Alexander Hamilton wants nothing to do with that. He's not going to run for the governorship against Burr because he's in private life now. He's served his country both in the war and as Secretary of the Treasury in the Washington administration. And he's working in, in private business in Wall Street. Uh but he does not want Aaron Burr to be governor of the state of New York because he can't stand him. Now, the animosity between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton dates all the way back to the Revolutionary War. They were both junior officers at the same time in the Continental Army. And Aaron Burr was always very jealous of Alexander Hamilton because of Hamilton's very close relationship with General Washington being his aide to camp, and then that relationship carrying forward right into the Washington administration. So those two uh, not getting along has been going on for quite some time. So Alexander Hamilton, being a very powerful and popular Federalist in the state of New York, will do everything in his power to campaign against him while not running for the governorship. He'll write letters to the editor of major newspapers in the state, typically referring to Burr as a very dangerous man. And he'll also go on a speaking tour, condemning Aaron Burr, encouraging people to vote for his opposition, and uh, he'll make some pretty wild and damning accusations about Aaron Burr. In one part of the state, he insinuates that Aaron Burr is having an incestuous relationship with his daughter. Now, Aaron Burr and his daughter were very close, and, and Burr's daughter worked on his campaign. But obviously, uh, there's no credible evidence about this. It's just dirty politics, which a lot of Americans think is something relatively new. No, it's not. Mud was slinging like crazy in this governor's campaign. Then in another part of the state, Aaron, or excuse me, Alexander Hamilton made uh, innuendos that Aaron Burr was gay. So he's pulling out all the stops to dig up the dirt and spread it on Aaron Burr. And in the end run, Aaron Burr will lose the governorship, uh, governor's race in 1804 in New York. And the person he blames 
is his age-old enemy, Alexander Hamilton. So what this is ultimately going to lead to is the famous duel between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. Now, I've read quite a bit about this duel. And first of all, one thing I realized while reading about it, dueling was a very different thing than we get the impression of it in the movies. You know, I can remember as a kid thinking, you know, a duel started where one guy slapped the other guy in the face with a pair of gloves and said, I challenge you to a duel. And before you know it, they're shooting at each other. That's not the way it worked. There was a whole set of very complicated protocol before actual gunfights took place. And there was a lot of care to try to make it so both sides could save face and it wouldn't result in violence. And what would happen first is Aaron Burr sent a letter to Alexander Hamilton demanding a public apology for all the damning things he said about him. Alexander Hamilton replied to this letter and basically said, no way, I'm not, a, I'm not apologizing. So the protocol works next. You have to give him a second chance to apologize. <clears throat> Once again, Hamilton refused. So now they get to the point where of no return, they're going to go to the dueling field. So dueling was illegal in New York State. So they had to have the duel over across the Hudson in New Jersey, where dueling was still legal. Now, ironically enough, the reason why dueling was illegal in New York, partially, is because Alexander Hamilton and his wife, who was General Philip Schuyler's daughter, fought very hard for anti-dueling legislation to be passed in the state of New York because they had lost one of their sons in a duel, which broke both their hearts. So it's kind of surprising that Alexander Hamilton accepts the duel with Aaron Burr. But on the other hand, maybe it's not. The you know, muzzle loader pistols used for dueling in 1804 uh, were very inaccurate, and you were lucky to be able to hit the side of a barn with one. So one thing I didn't realize either was, in many cases, dueling would end with no one being harmed because both participants would shoot and miss, then their honor was saved, and they'd leave the dueling field unharmed. Now, on this fateful day over in Weehawken, New Jersey, on the dueling field, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton are given their dueling pistols. They pace off. And when the dueling begins, eyewitness recounts say that Alexander Hamilton took his pistol and fired harmlessly off up into the air, not even aiming at Aaron Burr showing that he's not serious about it. Maybe this is the anti-dueler in him making a farce of it. Aaron Burr took game, and with a very lucky, or you might say unlucky shot for both of them, he hit Alexander Hamilton in the chest, and the bullet lodged against his spine. He'll suffer for about a day, and unfortunately the next day pass away as a result of Aaron Burr's shot on the dueling field. Now, after this happens and the word spreads in New York, New Yorkers are furious. Aaron Burr has just murdered as many as uh, people consider it back then. The most popular New Yorker by far in our history, Alexander Hamilton. So, New York State issues... Uh, arrest warrants for Aaron Burr, even though I'm not quite sure how they could. Uh, if there was a murder, it took place in New Jersey and dueling was still legal there, but didn't matter. They were going to try to arrest him. <clears throat> now, to make a long story short about Aaron Burr, Aaron Burr flees to the West. He goes to Pennsylvania. Uh, he then gets on river barges 
on the Ohio River because he knows officials from New York will be in hot pursuit. And in all likelihood, if they catch up with him, there won't be a trial. He'll be shot resisting arrest for killing Alexander Hamilton. <clears throat> and as Aaron Burr makes his way out to the west, all the way down the Mississippi to the uh, the Louisiana Territory, he will slowly but surely apparently start to lose his mind temporarily. And he'll start telling friends of his these wild stories of how he's going to raise an army out in Louisiana and start a war uh, with Spain. And he'll win this war, become a hero, uh, and... Uh, somehow or another, the people of the Louisiana Territory will rise up and make him King Burr or something wild. <clears throat> now, one person that was in cahoots with him was another uh, military officer pal of his who was still active in the military, General James Wilkinson. Wilkinson was in on the plot, but then when he finds out government officials are getting suspicious... He'll turn rat and turn Burr in, or at least he'll tell the government what he knows about it. Wilkinson was a real slimy dog. I mean, he was a he was a traitorous devil. Some of the things he did makes Benedict Arnold's betrayal look mild, but I don't have time to tell you about that today. Now, Burr will be arrested, brought back to Washington under orders of President Jefferson, and he'll be tried for treason for attempting to start this rebellion. Now, uh, he, the trial will be the landmark trial of the time. And the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, our old pal uh, Marshall, will step down off the bench and preside over the trial. Uh, in the end run, Marshall will have no choice but to find Burr not guilty because no one will travel all the way from the Ohio River Valley and Mississippi River Valley to come back to testify against Burr as to what they heard of him talking about this treasonous plot. So basically all they have is hearsay evidence, just sign affidavits, which aren't going to make it in a treason courtroom because the penalty for treason is execution. So since no one will come and testify, and it's not like the old days, you just have federal marshals fly out and subpoena them, bring them back. Chief Judge Marshall has no choice but to find him not guilty. So almost immediately, Aaron Burr will jump on a ship and sail to France where he'll stay in self inspection posed exile for quite some time, knowing that New York authorities would still be hunting him. <clears throat> later on, about 10 years later, he'll return to New York City. Things have cleared over by then. He'll start a law firm once again, and that's where he'll die of natural causes. So that's the crazy, sad saga of Aaron Burr, who goes from vice president one day to wanted felon to self-imposed exile and unfortunately, also the end of the chapter for our New York hero, Alexander Hamilton. <clears throat> so next, what we want to do is turn our attention to the foreign policy front and talk about what's going on in Jefferson's second term in office. And actually, it begins with the things that lead up to the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, after the Louisiana Purchase, the Napoleonic Wars begin in Europe in 1803. And this is Napoleon's quest to become emperor of the world that we talked about before. And uh, as soon as this war breaks out, Thomas Jefferson very quickly will declare us neutral. We're not going to back anyone in this war. Taking a tip from his former boss, President Washington, and also one of Jefferson's uh, evolving goals as president was he envisioned a world of world peace. That's partially part of the reason why he severely cut back the budgets of the Army and the Navy 
besides the cost-saving measures. He dreamed of world peace. And one way to have world peace is not to have large standing armies during a time of peace. So, uh, initially, we will benefit tremendously from the Napoleonic Wars because all of Europe's at war. We will quickly become the largest neutral, neutral carrier of goods in the world. And we're going to be uh, manufacturing and shipping items to Europe like crazy because Europe is all embroiled in this horrible warfare with Napoleon. Uh, it will really make our factories finally develop. And, you know, by 1805, 1806, industry is booming in America because of all this demand by Europeans. Our farmers can't grow crops fast enough uh, because we're feeding Europe too. And the United States economically really prospers during the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars. Kind of ironic when you think about it, this was what Alexander Hamilton had dreamed of. And when he's killed by Aaron Burr, he's never really going to get to experience this economic prosperity that overtakes America in sort of a, a strange twist of fate. <clears throat> now, this boom time in America uh, finally starts to... Uh, dawn upon both the British and the French, the two major players in these Napoleonic Wars, even though it's a world war. And both of them are going to start putting pressure on the Jefferson administration to take sides in the war. Now, the French think they have legitimate arguments because of Jefferson's uh, liking of the French culture and so forth and being pro-French but there's no way he's backing the tyrant Napoleon. And that's where the British think they have the trump card because they keep egging on the Jefferson administration that they need assistance <clears throat> to put an end to this tyrant trying to conquer the world, namely Napoleon. <clears throat> so both sides are playing games with the United States and what this turns into is what becomes known as the impressment of sailors. Now, we talked about this the first time in class when we talked about when the British, after the Prohibitory Act, were arresting any American ships on the high seas and immediately uh, accusing them of smuggling since we weren't selling anything or buying anything from the British, <clears throat> Excuse me. And the United, you know, colonists accused the uh, British of impressing sailors. And the British basically said, you can't impress someone from your own country. You all are British citizens still. Well, we're not anymore. And here's what starts happening on the high seas. Both British and French military ships, since... American cargo ships are just going nonstop to Europe, start stopping these ships on the high seas. They'd go on board and they'd search for deserters because both navies, but especially the British Navy, was experiencing a large number of deserters from the British Navy. They would desert the Navy and then get a job as a crew member on an American cargo ship that was a much safer job and paid much more. And the British knew this. And there was a limited amount of French sailors doing the same thing. So they'd go on board and look for deserters. And the way they did this, they'd just sort of do a quick interview with the sailors. Obviously, if you had a heavy French accent, you'd be grabbed up by a French uh, naval vessel and put back on it and pressed back into service because they figured you were a deserter. On British or on American ships stopped by the British, it's much trickier. And they would just grab Brit or 
uh, crew members who had a heavy British accent and immediately accused them of desertion and forced them back into service or impressed them into the British Navy. Plenty of Americans still had British accents. And most of New England, the accent of New England back in this period, was more like a British accent than a New England accent today. So there was a lot of mistaking American citizens for British sailors on the part of the British Navy. And in fact, between 1803 and 1812, when the War of 1812 begins, and this is one of the big issues that causes the war, <clears throat> Somewhere between six and 9,000 sailors will be taken off U.S. vessels and impressed into service in the British Navy. And this is becoming more and more unpopular as time goes by among Americans. And Amer a lot of Americans are saying we need to declare war against England to get them to knock this off. But on the other side, we don't want to back Napoleon. So uh, what's going to happen that's almost going to cause the War of 1812 to be known as the War of 1807 is the famous Chesapeake Affair. Now, this will happen off the coast of Virginia in U.S. territorial waters in 1807. The U.S. naval vessel, the USS Chesapeake, is on a routine patrol of the coast of Virginia in our own waters. It's approached by a British naval vessel, uh, the British naval vessel, the UMS Leopard. <clears throat> the captain of the Leopard requests permission to board the Chesapeake to search for deserters. Now, that's a standard procedure if they were pulling over a cargo ship. This is a U.S. naval vessel in its own waters. The captain of the Chesapeake refuses this request to board her, <clears throat> which obviously they have every right to, and it is sort of ridiculous to think British Navy uh, deserters would be on an American naval vessel. They're going to get a job on a commercial ship that pays more. So when they're denied permission to board, the Leopard, who is obviously prepared for this, it opens fire with the broadside of her cannon in very close quarters onto the Chesapeake. Uh, when the uh, <clears throat> smoke clears, three American sailors lay dead, and another 16 are wounded in this exchange. <clears throat> After it's all said and done, the leopard sails off cowardly uh, after inflicting this damage upon the USS Chesapeake. When word of this gets to Washington and to Congress, a lot of people in the Capitol want to declare war on England, considering this an outright act of war. And it's going to be everything Thomas Jefferson can do for the next couple years to keep the United States out of war. And he's going to get two pieces of legislation passed through Congress in an attempt to stop any war involving the United States with any of these warring parties. <clears throat> the first act he's going to have passed is the Non-Importation Act, which is supposed to be a direct punishment on England and bar all imports from England into the United States. The British are mad about this, protest it, and basically say, that means you're taking sides on the side of the French. So Jefferson, not wanting to be accused of taking sides in this war and remaining neutral, gets Congress to pass the Embargo Act 
of 1807. This stops basically all trade whatsoever with all the warring parties in the Napoleonic Wars, essentially all of Europe. This will get the U.S. ships off the high seas so they're not having sailors impressed anymore, but it's also going to destroy the United States economy. And we'll go from this point of economic prosperity like we'd never seen before to a depression in a matter of months because of this total lack of trade. It didn't really hurt the Europeans much, but boy, did it hurt the United States economy. And the only way for Americans to make a living, especially our farmers, is they were gonna have to engage in smuggling. And one place that was smuggling central was right here in the Champlain Valley. It was a way for farmers in New England to smuggle their goods up to British Canada on Lake Champlain and the Richelieu River. And if you read journals of this time, there was a nonstop flow of ships up and down Lake Champlain carrying cargo to what was still British Canada at the time, carrying on this illegal trade, violating the Embargo Act. But you got to remember, we're up here in the middle of nowhere, and we can get away with it up here. So that's enough for this first lecture, where we'll pick up, we'll talk about uh, the election of 1808 next, and we're going to be uh, moving right into the War of 1812. So I'm going to take a little break. I'm getting a bit of horse. I need to get a drink of water here. And I'll be back to talk to you uh, shortly. See you soon.